Okay. Uh, hopefully, that has fixed the issue. And hopefully, it's not just temporary. Um, okay. So, I have now recorded stuff to the cloud instead, uh, just in case this happens again, because I'm pretty sure the first hour of local recording is gone. Not that um, it matters anyway, because it was just syllabus stuff. So, um, thank you for the emails for the verbal agreement paper. And I just got an email for the entire classification of Chinese compounds paper. So those ones are now filled. So thank you for that. Um, okay. So uh, the first four weeks are basically simple morphological processes and how we can model them. So affixation, um, very basic compounding, stuff like back formation, like babysitter to babysit, uh, internal change, like how do we account for ring, rang, rung compared to like uh, jump, jumped, and jumped. Uh, the third unit will be on compounds and phrases. So we're going to prove that there are differences between compounds and phrases. And we'll show some tests for those. We'll also show the different types of compounds across different languages. Uh, after the reading week, we'll talk about valency. So these are uh, things like English passivization. So uh, I ate hamburgers, hamburgers were eaten by me, or hamburgers were eaten. So in the active, you have like, I ate hamburgers. So you have two things, two noun phrases. But then in the passive, you have hamburgers were eaten. You just have one noun phrase. So you've gotten rid of one. And valency is really about removing or adding arguments into words. So English does this through sentences, and syntax. Uh, other languages will do it just in the word itself. We'll talk about derivation and productivity uh, and inflectional paradigms. So this was derivation versus inflection, which is something you do in like one week in 220 that is uh, way more complicated than you would have believed it is. So usually in 220, and at the beginning of this course, we will say things are either in derivational or inflectional. What we'll find out instead is that actually a lot of affixes are a little bit derivational and a little bit inflectional. It's just how derivational or how inflectional something it is that, that determines its category. Uh, and then we'll finish the course with morphophonology. So I know there's a lot of you in 320 one this semester. So we'll do this at the end of the course. So that way it'll make a bit more sense. And even if you don't have 321 phonology done, uh, by the end of the course, you'll be able to understand all the stuff that we need for it. So this is where we'll see actually a totally new way of doing morphology at the end of the course. Um, so in this course, we're covering about three or four different theories of morphology, three or four different models. In reality, there are about 13 to 15 ones that are used around the world right now. Um, and it's kind of like in syntax or phonology. Well, how, you know, in syntax, we'll start with like these tree structures that have like three branches. And then we'll say, hold on a second. Actually, we just want everything with two branches. So we have to do this X bar structure. And then in grad school, you say, well, actually you don't always need the bar levels. So we'll just get rid of those when we don't need them. Um, but actually in syntax, there are a lot of other theories and models that we don't use. A lot of theories and models that are not based on tree structures. And SFU doesn't teach them because we don't have researchers that, that work with those models. Um, in this course, I wanna show you some stuff that is not necessarily popular here, but is popular in other areas of the world or is used in other areas of the world because there's always multiple different ways to explain things. Uh, SFU linguists take a stance in phonology and syntax about what they wanna teach and how they wanna teach it. Um, but if you go somewhere else in the world, you might learn a different system to explain the same things. And every system has assumptions about how language works. Every system has pros and cons on what they can handle and what they can't handle. So uh, I really want to expose in this course so some of the, the flaws and alternative methods that there are to doing some of these things. 
So uh, if you've taken phonology, for example, you'll start with rules that are like A turns to B in the context of X and Y. And then you discover, actually, those are horrible ways to do rules because they don't account nicely for things. And you learn about doing rules with tree structures. And then you'll find some issues there. And then you'll talk about doing rules with constraints and tableaus and tables, and you'll find there are issues there. So no matter what subdiscipline you go to in linguistics, uh, it's a lot of different ways to do things. We're still not sure what the best way is. OK. Um, yeah, it didn't seem like there are any questions before all the technical issues, but if you do have any questions about the course stuff now, please uh, let me know and then we'll start with the core concepts. Okay. Um, so I'm getting emails about articles that you all want right now, just so you know, it will be first come first serve. Uh, so if you can't get something, I will let you know. Okay, okay. Uh, today is about words and morphemes. So specifically like what are words and how can we categorize them? And when we say what are words, we're not gonna get a nice answer to that but we'll get a few definitions that we can work with, uh, what morphemes are and how we can categorize those. So uh, like, how do we determine whether something is an affix or not? What are the different types of affixes? And we'll take a look at one of the most common ways to make new words, which of course is through affixation. So a word like jump becoming jumped, adding that extra ed at the end or the t sound. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to interrupt me either in chat or through voice. I can't guarantee chat will work for me, but uh, if I see it, I'll answer your question. Okay, so what is morphology? There are a lot of definitions of morphology out there. And depending on what a linguist is interested in, their definition may be more skewed to either talking about uh, saying that morphology is like the analysis of uh, how words and units are combined to make meaning. So something like affixation, where you have a root like jump, a morpheme like ed for past tense, and those come together, and that's what morphology studies. Uh, others might be a little bit more general and say it's just about how words change when meaning changes. And this is really a, a good definition. So how word shape changes are related to changes in meaning. So if we think about phonology, in phonology, we just talk about changes in sounds, but it doesn't really have anything to do with meaning. It's just like a, a universal word uh, thing going on. So uh, for instance, if we talk about when words in phonology change from like a, an unaspirated P to like an aspirated P. Now that is entirely to do based on sounds, based on syllables. It has nothing to do with meaning. So we're not really interested in that kind of stuff. Instead, we're interested in how words change or affixes change uh, when there's a change in meaning too. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later at the end of lecture for what these look like. But we're not only interested in the word itself, but also those units that change word forms. So the, the affixes, the, the internal change from ring, rang, rung, what is the vowel doing there? We're interested in those patterns as well, not just the words. So one example of a question we can ask in morphology is something like here. So we could start with asking about a particular morpheme. We could say, well, do we have this past tense morpheme in English? Do we express that meaning? And we can answer as English speakers and we can say, yes, of course, we have past tense in English. We express it. And you might ask the question, well, then how do you express it? Is there just one way to do it? Because in some languages, the past tense is just a word and it never changes. It always just means past, it's pronounced in one way and it appears in the same spot. 
but it could be like English, where actually the past tense shows itself in many different ways. So uh, here's, here's five ways that the past tense shows up in English. So in writing, we could have jump to jumped, hug to hugged, need to needed, and these are all the ed endings. But morphology and language isn't really about writing. It's about sounds, because that's what language is. We interpret sounds. We don't interpret letters. Uh, letters are just representation of sounds. So the fact that these are all ed, uh, we don't really care too much about that. What we care more is about how it sounds. So in a word like jump, that past tense is pronounced as a T, jumped. And the word hug, that past tense is pronounced as a D, hugged. In need, that past tense is pronounced actually as two sounds. So needed, or uh, some people would write this as needed with an I, or even the ID with a little squiggle in it. So this is a, this is like, we take a look at the vowel space. Uh, it is like right here. This E sound with a line through it is like central high. So we can show it through affixation or we even have like internal change. So in a word like fight, that internal vowel is changing. And in a word like go, uh, everything just goes to hell. Like there's nothing in the word went that resembles go at all. It's just a completely different word. So yeah, we express past tense in English and we express it through multiple different ways. And the follow-up question could be like, okay, so can we come up with a rule for that? Can we come up with some sort of method that tells us where it's t, where it's d, where it's ud, where the vowel changes inside or where the whole word changes? And that can be very difficult. So to help us with this, we come up with different types of what we call conditioning. So what conditioning means is like, what is determining the form of that morpheme, the form of past tense? When is it a t? When is it a d? When is it an internal vowel change? So we talk about things like phonological conditioning. And phonological conditioning says, OK, what is determining the past tense is its phonology, is its sounds. So if I just get rid of some of these marks here on the screen. We might look at the t, the d, and the ed, and say, OK, it looks like something to do with the last sound is affecting which morpheme is showing up. So we could say, OK, these ones are phonologically conditioned, and there's going to be some rule that tells us which form it is. And uh, the rule right now isn't too important, but we could say, OK, so like P is voiceless. So, oh, look, the T is voiceless as well. Or we could say that the D, well, hugged. Well, this G, this G is voice, and so is the D. And then with a word like needed, uh, there's some very specific sounds where this happens. So it happens after D or T. So like needed or wanted. So we could come up with environments, and uh, we'll learn how to do that in next week's lecture. Um, but we say these ones are phonologically conditioned because it's about the sound that comes at the end of this root here that determines the form of the morpheme at the end. Okay, so um, if that's a little bit too much right now, that's fine. Just really just emphasizing that the phonology can determine what a morpheme looks like. There's also cases of what's called lexical conditioning. And this just means that like the morphological process is on like a word by word basis. So these are sort of like the exceptions or irregular words that we would say casually in English. So for example, if we think about a word like fight, if this followed the rules of everything else, like jumped, hugged, and needed, we would get the word Fighted, and that would be like uh, an ed at the end, an ud sound. But that's not what we get. 
we don't get fighted. Instead, we get some irregularity, some exception. We get fought. So this would be an example of lexical conditioning because there's not really a pattern to when this happens. This isn't predictable or as predictable. Uh, it's just a change depending on the word form. And like Goda went, there is no way in hell that you could ever predict that that would happen unless you already know the form of go and the form of went. Uh, otherwise, you would expect something like goad, which would be perfectly natural. Go ends with a vowel sound, so that ed would be pronounced like a d, d, goad. But it doesn't behave like that. It doesn't follow those phonological rules. Instead, um, it's an exception. We get went. So any questions about the differences between phonological and lexical conditioning? And again, don't worry too much about determining the rules. It's more just about understanding right now that morphological processes can be determined by sounds or can be determined by just irregularities. And maybe there's a nice way to explain those irregularities. But right now, we're not too focused on that. OK, so we can ask questions about morphology, specific morphemes, past tense. Now, I've been using this term morpheme, assuming that you know what it means. Um, but let's actually talk about it. because. When you think of the word morpheme, let's think of the morpheme bird. Chances are that when you think of morpheme itself in your brain, you're thinking of spelling. So you probably see this bird and you think, okay, this is a morpheme. But what a morpheme actually is, is, a, is the mental representation, the meaning of that. So the morpheme itself, is actually this thing. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bird. That's the actual morpheme. Now, how it appears in a sentence is as what's called a morph. So for example, in a sentence, uh, we would call this like a bird. That would be the actual morph that it appears as. So uh, with the example in the last slide, when we talked about the past tense morpheme, the morpheme itself is just the meaning of past, so happening in the past, the grammatical meaning of happening in the past. But the morphs that it shows up as could be like uh, the schwa and the duh for ud, or it could be just the duh or the tsu, or there could be um, a change in word or a change in vowel. It's a little bit harder to talk about in terms of morphs, but. Uh, the morpheme is the meaning itself, and the morph is how it shows up in the word. Now, uh, this is a lot like, say, phoneme and phone. Phoneme is like the mental representations of the sound. So, for example, um, you might have p, and then you'll have different ways that it comes up. So these would be like the phones. There's an unaspirated p, an aspirated p, a closed p. There's a bunch of different ways to actually interpret that. P and produce that P. So let's see this example. Uh, so we'll do an English example, we'll do a Turkish example, and sort of go up how these are broken up and how we can identify these. So uh, we'll start with English. And I'm sure you've all seen stuff like this, but just in case you haven't. Uh, when we have a translation in English, sometimes we'll use two lines. We'll give one line with the actual word itself in, written in that language. So in the first example, that first line is English. And in the second example, of course, this first line is going to be in Turkish, because this is uh, the data as we collected it, as we're transcribing it. Uh, in the second line, we have what is called the gloss. So this tells us what everything above means. So for example, in English, uh, this might be a little bit redundant to do, but it, it's a good way to explain the process. So for example, the fireflies flew and sucked their blood. 
So we might break this up into morphemes and say, okay, uh, in the word fireflies, we have three components. We have fire, we have fly, and we have this plural S. And we would give the meanings of these below. So we'd say, okay, well, fire just means fire, fly means fly. These are content words, so we'll just keep the direct English to English translation. It's a little pointless when we're working with English, but still demonstrates stuff. Uh, and then for this S, well, this has grammatical meaning. It's PL. This means that it's a plural marker. So if we just take a look at this gloss and fireflies, firefly plural, we know exactly what the plural looks like in English, where it is, uh, how it can be broken up. So we have this little dash here. And this dash just means that these can be broken up into their components. So it's fire and then fly, and then it's the plural morphine. But if we take a look at the next word, for example, we have this word blue. Let's get rid of that. Now, what's being expressed in this word flu? Well, we have the morpheme fly in here, so that's the content of the word, but it also has the past tense marker on it. But this isn't like a separable past tense. This isn't flied where we can separate fly and ed. No, instead we have flu. So something has changed inside of the word. The fly has become flu and an IPA. I mean, this is really just, sorry, that's too pointy stuff. Uh, this is really just a change in the vowel. So I goes to oop. And we can't separate this from the word fly. Like we can't take flu and break it up into fly and then a past tense morpheme. It's not that straightforward. So what we do in this case is we use a dot. And this just means that those two things are both shown in that morpheme. So flu contains both fly and past tense together, and we are not separating them. That's just what that means. So if we continue on and we take a look at the word sucked, so suck ed, Here's suck, here's the past tense ed, and then of course we use the dash here because this can be broken up into its two components, suck and the past tense. So suck and ed. Uh, and then finally, if we take a look at say their for their blood, there's a lot of information being conveyed here. So it's third person. Uh, this interpretation is plural, it could be singular but this interpretation is plural. And it's got this case called genitive case, which really just means like possession. So this one morpheme there, well, it's not really a morpheme, is it? Uh, there, the pronoun is a morph that expresses the meanings of three different morphemes. It's expressing plurality. It's expressing third personness. It's expressing possession, all within just one word form. And that three dot PL dot genitive, those dots just mean again, it can't be separated. So that's how English works. Um, and with say any other language like Turkish, it would behave the same way. So we have like a one-to-one -one correspondence of what these morphemes mean. So uh, we can break this up into say four parts. So C-O-C-U-K. Lar, Niz, and Dan. So this first bit means child. This Lar is a plural marker. Uh, Niz is your, with you know being plural your rather than singular your. And then Dan is something called the ablative. Now, it's not easy to figure out the actual meanings of these things. So we're also given a translation. So we'll see. We see child plural your plural ablative, and we're thinking, okay, what does that mean? Well, we're told it means from your children. Now, what you can do with this information sometimes is figure out what the different morphemes could mean. So you see ablative here, and you're probably thinking, well, what, what's ablative? What does that mean? And by looking at the translation, we might not get a completely accurate idea of what it means, but we can make a pretty good educated guess. So I see child, I see plural, I see your, 
the only thing I'm really missing is from. So uh, ablative doesn't really mean from. Uh, it just has to do with like adjuncts and prepositional phrases, that sort of meaning. But if we saw enough examples, we could infer what ablative case was. So we can use the gloss to inform ourselves about like uh, what particular aspects of the translation mean. Okay, I'm just realizing there's a lot of marks on this. I need to just get rid of the stuff that's not important to you. Okay, so as we go through the course, we'll see a lot of new stuff, a lot, of, a lot of new cases, a lot of new inflections that we haven't seen before. I'll try to explain them when we come around, but sometimes we'll have to figure out the meanings of what they are. So um, all of this information about morphemes and words, uh, we can use this to categorize words. I mean, we don't even know what a word is yet, but we're gonna categorize them anyway. So there are simple words and there are complex words. And in linguistics, simple usually just means like one component. Complex means multiple components. So when we have a word that is just one component, it is simple. So if we take a look at a word like the, so here, let me, let me pick some colors. So simple will be a box. So the is a nice simple word, has one component to it. Uh, sorry, flu is not a good example here. And, and is simple. Blood, blood is a simple word. It has just one component. What about complex words? So complex words have two or more morphemes. So in a word like fireflies, well, there's fire, there's fly, and there's a plural meaning to it. So this has more oh. than one morpheme in it. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but your screen is frozen again. It's frozen again. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> this is this is lovely. Why is it doing this today? Hmm. Okay. Let me see. I've had issues with Zoom too. Like I have to use it on my phone. I've, <laughs> my laptop just completely like gave up. Yeah, I've never had this particular issue before. So I'm a little confused as to why it's happening now and not yesterday when I was doing tests. Um, okay, so yeah, it's just like completely frozen. Eh? Well, let me. I think it's somewhat delayed. Like I just got some more stuff that you were writing now. So. It's not like a permanent solution, but I don't know if this will work for you. You could try logging out on your phone. That's the only way I've been able to use Zoom. Uh, okay, share.
Are we good now? <laughs> yeah, you're. No. I, we're good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just do the whole temporary like leave and come back. So okay. So this first meeting is going to be a little bit messed up as my Zoom uh, is awful, but hopefully by next week it'll be fixed. <laughs> okay. So complex words. Um, here, here's here's my question to you then. A word like flu. Is this word an example of a simple word or a complex word? Sorry, that, that was not a rhetorical question. Um, my questions ask a lot or sound a lot like rhetorical questions, but uh, just say in chat whether you believe this is a simple word or a complex word, the word flu. Complex, 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 good. Yeah, so this is complex. Um, now, if you're thinking of morphemes as being the written form itself, you might be thinking that flu is a simple word because it can't be broken up into pieces. But remember, morphemes are about meanings. So yeah, this has the meaning of fly and it has the meaning of past. Therefore, it is a complex word. So it's then a similar question for something like there. Okay, so this is a pronoun, right? Pronoun there. But if we ask, is a pronoun simple or complex, we get the same answer. Uh, pronouns are complex words because they have multiple meanings. So even if you say a word like I, we're expressing first person, we're expressing singularity. And if we say I in a sentence, we're also saying that this is going to be the subject of the sentence because we have a subject form I and we have an object form like me. So all pronouns in English are complex words. They express multiple meanings. Now, what about say the Turkish example from your children? And in this case, when we ask ourselves about the word, we see all these dashes connecting things. So we treat this entire thing as one word. Uh, and this would also be complex. And my advice to you, because this is a very easy trap to get into, is to remember that this translation is not saying anything about the morphology or about the syntax. The translation is only giving you meaning. So in English, this is a prepositional phrase from your children. In Turkish, this is not a prepositional phrase. This is a one word noun that has the meaning of a prepositional phrase in English. So um, the translations are there to help you. They're not there to dictate anything about the syntax or the morphology. So yeah, it might look like a sentence. It might look like a phrase, but actually in Turkish, this is a word. So the notion of simple and complex words isn't really a, a, a huge thing for us, but it is a nice way to talk about, you know, is, is there different morphemes in there? Like, oh, can we break this up? No, it's simple. Or yeah, you can break this up, it's complex. Now, how can we define a word? Well, let's talk about two definitions of words that are completely useless for us. Uh, the first example of a word, the first definition we can use is what's called an orthographic word. So this is defining words based on its orthography. So orthography meaning how it's written. So for example, uh, if you've ever taken Link 200, uh, usually this is how we define words for word counting. Um, so we would say I've, I apostrophe V-E. This is one word because there are no spaces in the spelling. But I have, which has a space there, would be two words. 
Now, when we think about I've and I have, they both mean the same thing. And I've is really just a contracted form of I have. So should it be one word? Eh, that's a question for later. Uh, words like set up, which can differ depending on the position of, a, of where it is in a sentence, uh, or if it's a verb or noun. So if you have set up with a space, we'd say, oh, that's two words. But if set up has a dash in there, a hyphen, you'd say, well, it's hyphenated, so actually it's one word. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really arbitrary, right? Uh, baseball versus baseball. You know, most people write it without a space, and then there's some people in the world who write it with a space in between. Uh, we don't talk about those people. But again, we can get a difference in word count based on how we write it. And for linguistics, this is so useless. Um, but it, it's, it's a way we could define a word, and it's a way that is convenient. It's not useful, but it's convenient. But it's arbitrary, of course, because again, when I emphasize, I say writing is just a way to express language. It's a way to, to note language down. It doesn't actually tell us anything about wordhood. Uh, what might be more useful is the definition of a phonological word. And in phonological words, we define words as being like these units that are used for stress assignment or for accent assignment or for pitch assignment. So a, a lot of what you think are words would be phonological words like brew or jump or dog or houses. Um, but there are some cases where phonological words are bigger than what we would expect a word to be. So for example, when something is stressless, that doesn't have any impact on stress assignment, never takes stress, um, that can be part of a phonological word with you know, other, uh, other words that, that we would think are words. So if I say, um, I bought something for the house, bought something for the house, for and the are not stressed, they're stressless, but house is stressed. So we could say phonologically, for the house makes one unit together. Uh, but this isn't too useful for us in a lot of cases because we know in syntax that this is a prepositional phrase with some sort of noun phrase after. And we know that the noun phrase can be separated from the preposition. So you could say, uh, bought something for the house, or it was the house that I bought something for. So we can separate for and the house. So saying it's a phonological word, it doesn't really jive well with how things behave syntactically. So there are going to be cases where this is, yeah, this is a useful definition. But for a lot of the stuff in morphology that involves syntax or the morphosyntactic side, it's not the most useful definition. So uh, what we're going to use instead is what's called uh, lexemes. So, so this is the important definition of a word. And when we say word, this is usually what we mean. So I will use the word word a lot. And when I say word, this is typically what I mean. I mean, it's called a lexeme. So uh, a lexeme is a word that conveys a meaning with different inflected forms. Now that is a not very useful definition. So let's just look at an example. Suppose I start with the word walk. This walk, this is an action. You can visualize this action in your head, the someone walking. Now, when you think of walk, and you want to use walk in a sentence, depending on the grammar of the sentence, sorry, if I'm looking blankly, something just happened on my screen. Um, if we think about the grammar of the sentence and we say, okay, we want to talk about like, I walk versus he walks. Okay, I walk, he walks. We get this difference in the grammar. Like we can't say he walk, we need he walks. So we have third person agreement. Or if something is in the past, we could say he walked 
or if something is ongoing, we can say he is walking. In all of these cases, the content, the action is the same, but we have different uh, grammatical meanings associated with it. So the lexeme itself, the word is walk, and we say it has multiple different inflected forms. So these different inflected forms uh, have to do with grammatical meaning. So he walks, I am walking, he walked, he had walked. Now, we can create a new word from walk that has different, either a different meaning or gives you a different word category. So for example, we have the word walker. Now walker has no longer an action. Its meaning has changed from action to individual. So this is someone who walks. So what we get here is we get a new meaning. We get a new lexeme. And that new lexeme will also have different inflected grammatical forms. So if we think about walkers, this just means there's more than one walker, but the content walker is still the same. Uh, or if we say walkers with an apostrophe S to mean a possessive, so it's that walker's shoes, it's that walker's water. The content walker is still the same, but its grammatical function has changed. So each lexeme in English will have different inflected word forms. And when we change the content or meaning of a word or even the category, we get a new lexeme. So we could get walker, uh, that's the human. Uh, what about walker as in the item? Um, yeah, sure. So we could have another lexeme walker. We'll call this walker two. And this is no longer the individual. This is the item. So this is something that helps uh, older people or disabled people, anyone with difficulties walking, it helps them walk. And that would have different inflections too. Like you could have multiple walkers or maybe that walker can have some sort of possession like the walker's wheel, for example. So these are all different lexemes. And uh, these lexemes together form what's called a word family. So walk, walker, walker to the item, uh, these are all related to each other. Um, we could even think of like a compound, like crosswalk. That could be a new lexeme that's formed from walk and that has different forms like the plural, uh, crosswalk, or even the possessive. If you could say like, oh, the crosswalks, uh, warning light is disabled or something like that. So um, the bit on the left, we usually write the lexeme in, in, in capital letters to mean meaning. So this is the meaning, and then there's different word forms, different inflections, or what we call different grammatical words. So walks, walking, walked. These are all part of the same lexeme, but these are different grammatical word forms or different grammatical words. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of terminology for how we can describe how words work, um, but essentially lexemes are like based on meaning, based on derivation, which we'll talk about more, and these grammatical words, different inflected word forms are, are grammatical things. So number, person, possession, uh, comparative, superlative. So as an exercise, we can ask ourselves, with these two sentences, usually I cut the bread on the table and yesterday I cut the bread on the table. You know, how can we talk about these words? So we wanna show that these are two distinct grammatical words. So where is the evidence for this? What, what would make cut in A and cut in B different grammatical word forms? Anyone can feel free to talk or type in chat. Uh, yes, Daisy. Um, I think that the choice between using usually and yesterday indicates the tense, uh, the grammatical tense. So for usually, you would say that it was a progressive verb, and yesterday is a past tense. <clears throat> uh, 
yeah so so you're you're mostly right there um we don't really we wouldn't really say usually i cut the bread on the table is progressive we might say it's habitual um yeah yes yeah so habitual i think is what you meant there um but we could also just say it's it's present tense that would be fine so we could say this is the present tense version of cut and in the second sentence yesterday i cut the bread on the table this is cut but it's past tense so these come from the same lexeme these come from cut the lexeme cut but they have different grammatical word forms there's the present tense form and there's the past tense form um, in fact even yesterday i had cut uh, you could also have the perfective form as well or like you said progressive uh, the actual cutting so uh, cutting would be the progressive form it's the only form that actually looks different so yeah so to drill in this we have the lexeme cut that has different grammatical word forms that we can see in the sentence a and b here so usually i cut being present and yesterday i cut being past okay are there any questions about lexemes and grammatical words Okay, if you do have questions and I go too fast because you're typing, you can just keep typing and I'll, I'll answer it when you're done typing. Um, okay, uh, now that we've defined words, we do need to talk a little bit about word categories. Now, if I check out Canvas quickly. In the back of, oh, that scared me. Uh, if we take a look at your canvas scores for determining whether a word is a noun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, or conjunction, from everyone who has responded, most people are pretty confident. So we're not going to spend too much time on this. Um, but one important point here is that word categories are, are separated into two bigger classes. So there's what we call lexical words and functional words. Uh, lexical words are defined as having like content or meaning. So usually this means that you can visualize it in the real world, um, that thing on itself. So if you think about like dog, you can visualize a dog in the real world. If you think about something that's green, you can think about something green. If you think about the word slowly, you can think of an action and you can imagine it happening slowly. Uh, prepositions, if you say a word like above, above the stove, you know, you can visualize that. It's, it's a relation. Uh, functional words, on the other hand, are grammatical. So these are words like determiners. So for example, the versus a. Uh, this is not something that you can necessarily visualize. This is a difference in meaning. So if you say the dog, you're talking about a specific dog that both people are aware of. If you're talking about a dog, you're just talking about any dog in general. Um, it doesn't change the meaning of the word itself, the content. It just specifies which one you're talking about. Uh, words like pronouns, like he or I. You might think, and you hear a pronoun like he, like, yeah, that's content that talks about someone in the real world. But he is actually telling you who in the sentence you're referring to, or maybe who in the real world. He is not the content itself. It's more like a reference marker to the content. Uh, dog is very specifically just dog. It's not a reference to a particular dog, while he is a reference to a particular person. Its meaning will depend on the sentence and the situation. So um, I, I don't want to call those inflections, but functional words usually have some sort of inflection to property, and lexical words usually don't. Okay, so um, 
I won't take too long for this, but just as a review, you can determine categories by meaning, inflection, and distribution. So in this case, we care more about meaning and inflection than distribution because we're not working with syntax. So nouns, people, places, things, abstract concepts. So you know the good old nouns, which you might've forgotten is something like happiness is also a noun. And you can determine that something is a noun by putting like a determiner before it. So the happiness um, or after an adjective, so you could say like great happiness. Uh, if you have verbs, you have actions or states of being. So an example like kick is obvious. Uh, feels might be pretty clear too. Um, but we also have these linking verbs like is. So you could say like X is Y, he is happy. So these can take different forms like the present, the past, uh, the perfect, and they usually connect a subject and object. Okay. Um, adjectives, again, these describe nouns. So if you have an adjective like great, usually the way you can see is by adding a word or like a morpheme like er to make greater, or you can use a comparative to make something like more great paraphrastic verb. Um, adverbs, these are words that modify verbs and sentences. So the key thing about adverbs is that they can be moved. So you could say slowly, I whatevered, or you can say I whatevered slowly. So adverbs can be moved around. That's sort of the key property of them. And finally, with prepositions, uh, prepositions introduce noun phrases. So whenever you have a preposition, you have some sort of noun phrase after. So you could say in, and then the noun phrase could be like the house. Okay, so that was like a super, super quick review of word categories. Uh, if anyone does struggle with them, I don't mind seeing you with office hours and going over them in more detail, but judging by the uh, background survey, spending more than this amount of time on it be generally unhelpful for most people. So instead, how about an exercise to, to show that you can do it? So for all of these underlined words, determine if they're a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, or a preposition. So I will give you two minutes to do this, and then we'll talk about it. Do you need two minutes? Probably not, but uh, there you go. Go over the answers in two minutes. If you do have any questions during this time, feel free to talk in chat or over voice, and I'm happy to answer. Okay. So hopefully that wasn't too difficult. Maybe just one or two that were a little tricky. Um, 
So how do I want to do this? Would anyone like to guide me through these word categories over voice? So just in order from all the underlined ones, what the categories are. You can type it in chat or just uh, speak up one of the two. Let me get that awful thing off the screen here. Okay, so humor me a bit. Uh, what is the category for old? Adjective. Yeah, it's an adjective. Okay, what about man? Here's a nice, another easy one. Man is a noun. Okay, what about the word felt? It's a verb. It's a verb. What about like? Preposition. Yeah, preposition. Okay, so what like was really the harder one here. Uh, a big doofus, so big is an adjective, doofus is a noun. You might not know what doofus means, but you see uh there, so a noun has to come someplace. Uh, tried is a past tense verb. Shovel is a verb. You shovel snow. With is a preposition. Tiny is an adjective. Describes what the fork is, which is a noun. And yesterday, what is the category of the word yesterday? Adverb. Adverb, yeah. So this might have been the other one. That was a little bit more difficult. Uh, but the key here is that you can take that word yesterday and you can move it to the front of a sentence and it's still grammatical. So yesterday, an old man felt like a big doofus after he tried to shovel snow with a tiny fork. Okay, so if you got those, fantastic. If not, you can always talk to me for a little bit of help with these. Um, but we just need to know these five basics for when we build word trees. Because if we don't know the base words and we attach an affix to it, uh, in order to really figure out rules for a lot of these, we need to know how to identify what a noun is or what a verb is. So, of course, with 301 and 309 as the prereqs, probably not an issue. Okay. Um, so, all of the other words that are not highlighted here, like, uh, I'll use a different color, like, and after a uh, he to and a uh, um, these are all examples of what are called the functional word categories so uh, n and a uh are articles after here is a conjunction uh, he of course is a pronoun two is an infinitive marker and then a uh is another determiner so if you don't know what those mean yet that's fine and we'll talk about those later. Um, so yeah, let's just take another 10 minute break and hopefully there won't be any more problems. If you have any questions during the break, feel free to type them in chat and I'll be happy to type back and answer them. Um, yeah, so apologies for all the technical errors so far, but I will see you again in 10 minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Um, please. Let's. Uh, I just want to show that the twenty-five people have been signed up for articles already. Uh, two people asking for the classification of Chinese compounds. Please check your email. Uh, that one has filled. And there's still room for Fitzgerald, Gravito, McCarthy, and Prince. And uh, now an incorporation. Uh, what I will say, because, you know, the first one is Fitzgerald. This one doesn't have anyone here yet. First presentation and everything is always marked more leniently than the others. So don't be afraid of being first. Uh, okay. So, um, did anyone have any questions from the first, from, I guess, the, the last hour that you might have thought of during the break? Okay. That's good. Um, so we've classified words according to word category. Now let's talk about morpheme classification. Because, uh, you know, words are made of morphemes. We can categorize words. So why can't we categorize morphemes too? And it's really not just like, oh, why shouldn't we? It's more like we have evidence that there are certain morphemes that behave differently from other morphemes. So. We're going to classify those morphemes based on their behavior. So the first uh, dimension that we'll categorize morphemes as is free versus bound. So why does this arise? Well, when we have a word like hunting, uh, we can notice something about that word. And that is that it is formed from the lexeme hunt. So we start with hunt, and we realize that that can stand on its own. Now we create a new word. We get the word form hunting by adding this ing suffix to it. So it's just morpheme combining with morpheme to create a new word. But when we think about the behavior of this ing suffix, and we ask ourselves, can it do what hunt does? Can it stand on its own as a free word we find that, well, if we just write ing, this doesn't have any, well, it might have meaning on its own, but it's certainly not able to stand alone as an English word. So there is a difference in how the morpheme hunt behaves and how the morpheme ing behaves. One can stand alone as a word, the other one can't. So we classify this distinction as free versus bound. If it can stand on its own, it is a free morpheme. If it cannot stand on its own, it is called a bound morpheme. Now, this has nothing to do with whether you can have, like, say, a valid word form. Like, there's no requirement that says you must have a free morpheme in a word, or you must have a bound morpheme in a word. Uh, this is just simply a way of classifying different types of morphemes. Uh, am I frozen again? I have to ask. Yes, I think so. As I am. Well, at least it's predictable. So let me do the good old come back in 30 seconds. Thank you, Zoom. You're wonderful. There we go. See, at least I'm fast at it now. Okay. And it's cloud recording, so everything should work just fine. Okay. So the behavior is if, if it can stand on its own, it's free. If not, it's bound. So we can create words through combinations of free and bound morphemes. So a lot of words that we have in English are either going to consist of just a free morpheme or free and some bound morphemes. 
So another word could be like um, marinated. So you have marinate plus you have the past tense ed. The ed cannot stand on its own. That's bound, but marinate can stand on its own and that's free. Uh, how do you add your name? You just send me an email or a private message on Zoom. Okay, so if a word, there's a special word category. So if it's consisting of say two free morphemes, you have a word like blackboard. So black can stand on its own and board can stand on its own. Uh, that's called a compound. So a compound has just two or more free morphemes. And we won't talk about compounds that much in this lecture or the next one because we have a whole lecture set dedicated to compounds. Um, so I'll just point that out. But I will also point out some words that consist of just bound morphemes. So I remember TAing Ling220 introduction to linguistics a lot. And a lot of questions are like, can we make words with just bound morphemes? Or, hey, we have this word and you ask, well, what's the root or what's the base? And that's well, sometimes a confusing question because you say, well, neither of those can stand on their own. So an example of this is a word like octopus. Um, octo is a prefix from Greek that means eight. Now, when you think of puss on its own in octopus, there's no word in English that is just puss on its own. There's a word like pus, but the meaning has nothing to do with octopus. Um, and actually, that's because this is from a Greek word. Uh, the Greek word. This is the this is the s sound. It's the it's the sigma at the end of words. I forget how to write it. Um, but this means leg or foot. So the word octopus is really literally translated as eight leg or eight foot. Um, but in modern English, these are both bound morphemes. So neither of these can stand on their own. You can't say octo on its own. You can't say puss on its own. But um, you have to put them together in order to make a word. And a lot of the cases where we have two bound morphemes coming together to make a word, uh, these are what are called neoclassical compounds. And neoclassical, well, neo means new. So we call these new classical um, because they're, they're, they're in English, but they usually come from say Greek or Latin as most English words do. Um, but specifically, these are English, uh, these are Latin or Greek words that used to be free morphemes. So, Octo and pus may have been free morphemes back in Greek, but as time moved on in modern English, these are no longer free morphemes. These are both bound. So uh, a lot of these neoclassical compounds have been transitioned from what used to be free plus bound combinations or free plus free combinations into just bound plus bound in modern English. So inept is another example. Uh, we don't actually have a word on its own that is ept, we have apt, which has a very similar meaning. But we, we do know that in is a morphine because in is a lot like immovable um, or uh, irrelevant. So different forms of in basically meaning not, to be not ept. And of course, ept just comes from the word apt, but Ept is itself um, of, I think that's Latin origin, so ineptus. So here's another case where instead of Greek, we have two old uh, morphemes in Latin that are still used in English, but can only be used in a bound sense. So, and that's because we cannot just say in on its own, in the prefix on its own, or ept on its own. Now you might ask yourself again, well, hold on a second. What do you mean I can't say in on its own? I can say in on its own. Yeah, but it has a completely different meaning. 
we can't say the in meaning not on its own. You can't say like, yeah, that's so in cool. That's so not cool. Like you can't make that interchange there. So even though in 220, sometimes we tell you that, no, you cannot have a word with two bound morphemes. It is fine. You do not need a free morpheme to have a word in English. Okay, uh, thank you for the messages. I'll put you in those two groups. Now, affixation. We've been looking at tons of affixes today, and now we'll finally talk about specific types of affixes. So affixes are anything that attach after a word, inside a word, before a word, like they're just units that are strung together that cannot stand on their own. So all of these affixes must attach to words. In other words, these are all bound morphemes. So if we have a word like reassessability, well, we can start with a word like assess. Now uh, that is fine. And we could add able to it to make accessibility. Or, sorry, sorry, uh, accessible, accessible. And we could add itty after that to make accessibility. And then we could add re to make reaccessibility. Or perhaps there's a different structure where we have assess and then we make reassess. Or then we have reassess and then we make reaccessible and then reaccessibility. So there might be different ways that we can combine these morphemes to make words. Uh, but the fact is, is that we can start with a base word like assess. We can start with that lexeme. And then we can derive new lexemes. So accessible, accessibility, reaccessibility, reassess, reaccessible, and so on. So we have different types of affixes. Uh, the most common ones that we know from English are called prefixes and suffixes, things that attach to the beginning or end of a word. Um, but we'll see some more than just that. So, so here's some terminology. We say that the root in a word is the lexeme that gives the core meaning of a word. So in reaccessibility, the core meaning here is the word assess. Like that's the action, assess. And when we add prefixes and suffixes, we can change the meaning of that root, but there's still some resemblance to that initial root. So reassess is to assess again. Accessible means it is able to be assessed. So all of those have some meaning of accession of, is that a word? I don't know. So the, these prefixes attach before, so everything to the left of assess is a prefix and suffixes attach after. So everything after assess is what's called a suffix. Now you might be thinking, hold on a second, there's this a bowl in between assess and itty. So why is this a suffix? Shouldn't it be like an infix or something? But affixes are defined relative to the root. So the root itself is assess. So when we talk about these affixes, we're thinking about where is it in relation to the word assess, to that, to that root. And because both able and itty come after assess, they're both suffixes. There are two suffixes on that word. So here's an example from Polish, and we can you know, practice some, some understanding of gloss too. So we start with the bare form here, filter, and we're defining this as a noun. Okay, and now we've made this new word, which is to filter. So it's become a verb now, it's a V. So we've had some process that goes from N to V. And now we end up with something like uh, filtra or what? I cannot pronounce Polish, but um, essentially we have filter. We have this morpheme owa, that is what's called a denominalizer. So what this just means is that it's taking a noun and it's changing it to something else. 
process, denominalize to make not nominal, which is not a noun. Uh, and then it has this morpheme, the C, which makes it an infinitive. So an infinitive is a verb form. So this is telling us that uh, it's the verb form and it's giving it this, this plain, like two filter sort of meaning. So in this case, if we ask, what are these morphemes? Are these prefixes or suffixes or what? Well, we have, uh, let me just move that down. What we have is we have the root, which is filter. This is giving us the meaning and we can get that from the translation to filter. And then because the root is filter, we define our affixes relative to the root. So owa and the C come after. So these are both two suffixes. So root suffix suffix here. No prefixes in this particular Polish example. So uh, those two are kind of nice. We have these in English. We have lots of examples of prefixes and suffixes. Uh, but let's take a look at some more interesting ones that uh, we, we kind of have, but not that much. So infixes and circumfixes. Infixes are often confused with suffixes and prefixes, depending on how they're formed. But here's the very simple definition of it. An infix is a morpheme that is inserted inside of the root. So imagine we have this word hofna, meaning smell. Now, when we say we have an infix that goes inside the root, what this means, you know, if we put our little, our little box around it that says this is the root, uh, something is going to go in between hofna to form a new word. That's what the infix is doing. It's going inside of hofna. So we see, for example, uh, hofchina. So this is smell. This is no longer the infinitive smell. Instead, chi represents this second person singular agreement. So this is like, um, it's expressing that there's agreement with the word you. So the you is used somewhere else in the sentence to express meaning and that infix has been inserted. So what we notice is that hof na is no longer together. Instead it's hof na, and then we've had something being inserted inside. So that's what makes this an infix. It goes inside of that root. Now sort of the opposite of an infix is a circumfix. So infixes go inside, circumfixes go around the root. So to demonstrate this, uh, here's Malay. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong again, but Karia is work. And if we wanna change this to occupation, so something a little bit more abstract than work, or um, I forget the exact name of what this morpheme is doing in terms of meaning. A lot of the derivational morphemes uh, do have specific names, but there are so many, they're hard to remember. So work is being changed to occupation, and what's happening here is we get this hey out front and we get on in the back to get pe carry on, something like that. And this goes around the root. Now there might be like a prefix or a suffix in there as well. And your question might be, well, how can we tell the difference between a circumfix and just a prefix and a suffix? Because surely, maybe you have caria, and then we get pay caria, and then finally we get pay caria on. So maybe it's like a prefix and then a suffix, and then a suffix and a prefix. Um, what tells us that it's not this is that each side of that morpheme, so the pay and the on, they cannot just occur on their own. So you're never going to get something that's like pay caria. And you're never going to get something that's like uh, care ya on. These always have to come together as a unit. So that's how we can determine that something is a circumfix, if they always have to come together. 
Okay, are there any questions about these four types of affixes? Okay, so I have a question for you then. Is there an example of infixation or a circumfixation in a dialect of English that you might know, or just in general English? So prefixation and suffixation are, are a big part of English. Um, but we do have one case in English where we use infixation. Anyone know where that might be? Expletive, you're absolutely goddamn lutely right. So, uh, with words that are like three syllables or more with certain stress patterns, like absolutely, um, we can insert curse words inside the words to emphasize them. And this is all based entirely on stress. So this is some phonological conditioning. So absa goddamn lutely is fine. And this is an example of infixation. Um, that there. And depending on where you put it in the word, it might sound bad. So ab goddamn so lutely, this is very weird. Absolute goddamn tly, very, very weird. Um, it's dependent entirely on stress assignment. So if you take link 321 with uh, John Alderetti, he'll talk about that at some point. Uh, circumfixation though, actually, there's an example of circumfixation in English too. It's just not in every dialect. But if you watch movies, uh, you might have heard it. So you might have heard someone say something like, um, uh, I'm, I'm a fishing away, something like that, where you have this uh in front of progressive verbs, or I'm going somewhere. So I should really put in the extra dash there to show that this is a circumfix. So I'm a going somewhere, I'm a fishing away. So this does happen in some dialects of English, uh, just not a lot, and it is certainly not standard English. But these types of affixes do exist in different dialects of English. Is sing, sang, song, song an example of infixation? No, so this is something a little bit different. Uh, what we're going to see with like any sort of affix, um, sorry, any sort of infix, it, it may have different allomorphs of it, but it's still the idea of insertion of a morpheme. So if we think about sing, sang, sung, if we want to say this is insertion of a morpheme, what we're basically saying, um, let me make a new page here. Sing, sang, sung. If we think about IPA here, if this was infixation, we would have to say that we start with say sing, we add some morphine to it. So we get like sing with a star or something. We'll say star is just any random sound. And then the S gets deleted. We're left with that star and that star happens to be like an A or an A uh for past tense or past participle. So one way of doing it is just to say there's vowel changed. It's just like it to a ah, rather than like an infixation an, an infixation analysis because an infixation analysis has like these extra steps that make it a little bit more convoluted to get what you want while saying it's just vowel change it's a little bit more elegant and that vowel change pattern does happen across multiple different words 
it's also a little bit harder to justify having an infix for sing saying sung when there's like no other infixes in English. So that's a good question. I mean, it's a good question. Questions like that are good to keep in mind because those are the sorts of things that talk about is like, why would you pick one analysis over the other? Well, one reason here why we don't say this is an infix is because it gets more convoluted. That's a totally fine reason. Um, there's no justification for it in terms of other properties of that same language. It's another good reason for it. Okay, so for practice, I'm sure a lot of you have done this problem before. It might've been a few years. So uh, here is a data set and your goal is to identify all of the root of all of these different words and all of the affixes in G. So I, I don't really care about A, B, C, D, E, or F. What I care about is this last one. But you'll need to look at all of the words in order to determine the morphemes in G here. So, um, so what you'll do is you'll define, so you'll identify the root in all affixes in G. You'll tell me which of these words, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are simple. And in G, when you finally break it up into its components, I want you to tell me whether each affix in G is a prefix, a suffix, an infix, or a circumfix. So for this one, um, I will give you, say, six minutes or so. Uh, I will open breakout rooms up. You do not have to go into them if you don't want to, but if you do want to have a chat with some uh, other people, you are free to go. So I will allow uh, you to choose your own rooms if you want to organize that. So if you want to work on this together, that's fine. Otherwise, I will start the timer for six minutes and then we'll go over the solutions. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me in chat um, over voice or over text. There we go.
Okay, I gotta remember there's a 60 second window where the breakout rooms close. So I gotta close them 30 seconds before I wanna talk. Um, quick update. Uh, one email for someone, a small group who couldn't get the article they wanted, but everyone else who has emailed me so far has gotten uh, what they've wanted between last break and now. So I've updated the names on the syllabus. Um, if I spell anything wrong, I'm sorry, I'll change it later. I just copy and pasted from the emails. Uh, okay. So, first of all, on a scale of one to five, where one is easy and five is hard, how did you all find this exercise? One, two, one. Okay, if two, no, no fours and fives, which is good. Um, so yeah, this, this wasn't meant to be hard. This is just uh, to make sure that we can still work with this stuff and understand the terms that we've reviewed today. So identify the root and all affixes in G. So whenever you have a data set, and I know I'm talking about this after you've done it, but it's always good to stumble a little bit on your own before having a procedure refreshed. Uh, whenever you have a data set, it's often a good idea to try to find like these things called minimal pairs. And in phonology, a minimal pair is something where two words differ by one sound. But in morphology, we're looking where two things change by one meaning. So what I mean by this is if we compare, say, D and A, the difference between by and bought, what's the difference here? The difference is past tense. So that's the only difference between buy and bought. But that what that means is that what we see different in this minimal pair, so in which case, XAR, XARID, the difference is the ID. So this means that the past tense, at least one of the forms, if there are multiple forms, is it ID. So then we continue. If we go between, say, bought and you bought, well, what's the difference in meaning? It's U. So what do we see that's different from A and B? Well, we see there's a difference in this suffix E. So we can say that. So the sound E, the letter I. So we could say that's a suffix. So we can go through and we can find all of these different ones. So M is I. Um, okay, you did not buy. We have, we have you bought. So in B, we have... Um, Sorry, the sorry, Khardi to mean uh, you bought. So when you take a look at you did not buy, well, what's the difference in meaning here? It's about negation, right? So whatever is different, in this case, na would mean negation. Uh, was buying, there's a difference between buy, uh, between bought and was buying. We get this mi. So when we put this all together, what we have in G is we have czar, this is the root, and then we have some morphemes that attach after. So we have id for past tense. We have uh, am, which would mean I. And then we have some stuff in front. So we have na in front, which we know means not. And then we have me in front which is this ing progressive form. So we could call this progressive. So we have like this breakdown. So that'd be identify all the roots and affixes in G. Okay, so we can break it up. In two, we can say which words are simple. Well, the only one with one morpheme is by and D. So this one is simple, but everything else is complex because there's more than one morpheme. And if we have to classify these as prefixes, suffixes, infixes, and circumfixes, what we can do is we can put a little box around the root and we can ask ourselves, where are the rest of the morphemes relative to the root? So the past tense id is after, so it's a suffix. M is after the root, it's a suffix. Uh, na meaning not is before the root. So this is a prefix and me before the root is also a prefix. So this is how we can break it down into its components. 
Um, and well, there's not really much else to say about this. Uh, maybe there's some insights into how inflections are ordered, um, but there's really just not enough data to, to make any interesting generalizations like where tense or aspect occurs or anything like that. So uh, that's how you would do that data set. Are there any questions about the process of completing these? Okay, yeah, that seems that seems pretty good. But this is something I think you got in 220 if you did the contemporary linguistic analysis textbook. So um, fun fact, this is also the problem I presented in Link 220 uh, 11 years ago when we used to have presentations for homework problems in that course. Anyways, um, so we could go into inflection versus derivation today, but we have a three hour lecture next week. So we have enough time to cover that then. So we'll stop that there. Uh, what I do want to do instead is just talk about like the first assignment, what it'll look like since say we have some time. Okay. Um, oh, it looks like I'm about to freeze soon too. That's incredible. <laughs> oh, that's predictable. Okay. Um, even if I even if the screen freezes at this point, it's it's not a big deal. Uh, I'll just talk as long as you can hear me. It's good. So the first assignment is only worth three percent of your grade, and the first quiz is only worth nine percent. It's pretty small. Uh, the goal is with the first assignment and the first quiz to to get a feeling of what the course is like, what what's expected of you, um, how the questions are formatted, all that kind of stuff. So there's some instructions above. Uh, you can just write answers in point form unless I specify that I want it written, in which case, please write it as like a paragraph. Uh, I, have some, I have some word counts suggested for things on these assignments, but uh, I'm not grading for word count. If you're way under the word count or way above the word count, I don't care. Um, you're not losing marks for that. Uh, what matters more is your ability to explain your thoughts. So if you have to take 1,000 words to explain your thoughts, go for it. If you can do it in 100 words, go for it. Um, but the goal is to get you explaining yourselves uh, as best as possible in as few words as possible. So you can do this with up to three people. Um, so yeah, don't, if you have friends, feel free to work with them. So the first problem in this one is just analyzing a data set just like we did. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, the same idea. Uh, the second question we'll talk about next week. Uh, the second question will ask you to argue whether a morpheme, F-U-L, full, that appears on two different words is really one morpheme or two morphemes. And we'll talk about how we can do that next week, but that's an example of like a written question. So like explain why they're the same morpheme or explain why they're different morphemes and give me some examples. And then this last question on assignment one will be about allomorphy. So we'll talk a little bit about allomorphy in class next week and you'll have to answer some questions about it. And the first question is usually always like, analyze the data set. It's kind of clean. Um, okay, based on the rules you come up with, if I gave you this new word, then what would it look like if we applied this morphological process? So just understanding the data set. And the second part is usually something like, okay, now here I'm adding some new words to it. And it doesn't follow your data analysis exactly as you've done before. So how can you change it? How can you account for these new words? And in this assignment, um, today, we talked a little bit about lexical conditioning and phonological conditioning. So for this assignment and this question, you'll have to ask yourself, well, can I account for these words with phonological conditioning or can I account for them only with lexical conditioning? So is it something predictable or is it something unpredictable? And based on those two different ways we could analyze these words, which one is better? And just argue for that. So, um, 
some questions are not always straightforward. Some answers we don't learn in class. Some questions are, I need you to go on your own and I need you to think about things and express your ideas and not be afraid of being wrong. So um, some questions in this course do not have right answers. Instead, what they have are arguments on both sides that haven't been completely determined. So um, sometimes there are problems you'll get that are tough that you'll have to think about a little bit and you'll have to justify it for yourself. And for those ones, again, I'm not always grading for correctness. I'm also grading for, um, are you arguing yourself? Is it, are you arguing for yourself? Is what you're saying comprehensible? Uh, does it make sense? And does it flow well? So first assignment is worth very little um, in the grand scheme of things, but hopefully it gets you a good idea of what the rest will look like. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have to say for today. Um, are there any questions about anything today or the course or concerns or comments? Uh, please also do not type them. Please speak them because my chat is literally frozen right now and I can't access it. Okay. Um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I can never tell. I mean, it's, it's an 8.33 hour class. Most of y'all are probably checked out mentally by now. Um, but when I don't have any response at all from my own computer, sometimes I have to ask. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, that is it for today's class. Uh, hopefully next week we won't have as many technical issues on my end, hopefully. And then the week after we might be in person, we might be online, who knows what the university is doing. Um, I'll keep you all updated. Uh, please keep sending me emails for papers if you're interested. Um, and as far as the groups go, I was asked the question, how will we know who is in our groups? Will we receive an email? How should we contact our group members? You can see the members of your group on the syllabus, but when we're three to four weeks out from a presentation, I will email you collectively on Canvas with all of you together and give you some slightly more detailed instructions. Um, so next week in class, I will talk about the actual parts of the project in more detail um, and a general timeline of how things should go. So I, I will try to contact the first group Fit, Fitzgerald sometime this week, just so you're together and give some more specific instructions. Um, but for everyone, we'll cover that next week in class. So do I have office hours today? <laughs> um, here, here's a question. Does anyone plan on coming to my office hours today? Because if you do, what I'm going to do is just stick around now uh, and then forgo my 12 to one because it's the first week and I do have something I have to do. So if you're sticking around for office hours or have questions, please do that now. Um, if not, I will see the rest of you next week. Um, thanks for coming out. I, I wish I could see your goodbye messages or anything in chat, but I can't. So uh, yeah, see you all next week. Uh, this will be uploaded the canvas sometime within the next 24 hours. <laughs> Sorry for the mess the first week. See you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Uh, actually, what I will do is I'll rejoin the meeting. If there is anyone left who wants to talk to me for office hours, I'll be back in 30 seconds. Okay, let me stop that recording too.